Station Houston on two. Are you ready for the event? International Space Station is definitely ready for the event. Copy that. ABC Nightline, this is Mission Control Houston. Please call the station for a voice check. Station, this is ABC Nightline. How do you hear me? It's a pleasure to talk to you, and I have you loud and clear. Great. Thank you so much for uh, giving us some time today to talk. We really appreciate it. Um, just wanted to start off with the space station itself is kind of like a living laboratory, you know, exploring the challenges of long-term uh, space travel. And what are some of the lessons that you have already learned? Well, I guess the first lesson that I've already learned for sure is it's pretty difficult to work when you take away the one constant you've had your whole life, and that is gravity. Uh, so just as a human being coming up here, now you're you're working in this crazy three-dimensional environment where there are no ceilings, floors, or walls. Everything is a workspace, as you can see in the video uh, behind me. And then the other thing that I, I've really learned is uh, we'll never make it to Mars. We'll never make it deep into space if we don't have a really robust life support system. And that, that's for the human body and also for the environment in the space station. And uh, I've gotten to see that firsthand up here on, the, on my first two months. Great. And, I mean, what sort of things happen long-term to the human body in space? Well, the biggest thing that, the biggest challenge, I guess I could say, that we've had to overcome is what happens to our muscle and, more importantly, what happens to our bone. Since we're not walking around every day, we're not putting any sort of impact loads onto our legs. We're not compressing our spine, our pelvis. So these bones, we really see a uh, almost osteoporosis-like loss of bone density when we're on the space station. So uh, through some really great science, great engineering, we've developed two main countermeasures, and that is uh, a fantastic treadmill. And the treadmill alone wasn't really enough, so we've also got a resistance device called ARED, and on that we can do really heavyweight squats, deadlifts, uh, bench press, shoulder press, and that gives us the kind of spinal compression, full body loading that we need. And astronauts are coming home now in as good a shape as when they left, so that's a huge development for us. And you guys are up there for a relatively short term. Are there any dangers of, you know, being up there in the long term, like living up in space for the rest of your life if, if the, you know, science ever goes to that point? Well, six months, six months is a pretty long time, and next year we'll have Scott Kelly, who will live up here for an entire year. And it'll be really interesting to see what we learn medically from him when he comes back. Uh, how's his body adapt over an entire year? I would say uh, to live up here for the rest of my life, that would be pretty excessive. Uh, there's, there's changes in the heart, changes in the blood. I can feel changes in my head, eyesight. Uh, so there's a lot of unanswered questions, and I don't think we're anywhere near sending someone up here for their entire lifetime. Part of our story also focuses on some experiments that are going on here on Earth where people are simulating living on Mars. Um, how can those experiments kind of prepare us for long-term space travel? Well, I have a few friends that have uh, participated in some of these, a few Europeans, a few American, and a couple Russian friends of mine. And uh, I think one of the most commonly known was a 500-day Earth-based mission which simulated going to Mars. And on that, while there's a lot you can learn on Earth, uh, first of all, how, how, do, how does a small group of people get along in a really confined environment for 500 days? Uh, what gets to you over a long term, like food? How's the food? How's your relationship? How's your medical? Uh, do you have the, the maintainability of your hardware to keep you going for 500 days? So I think all these basic questions can start to be investigated on Earth. And then you take the lessons learned there and apply them on the space station, which we're doing right now. And uh, hopefully we can answer these, these riddles before we set off on a 500 plus day mission out to Mars. And how does everyone manage in your tiny uh, compact environment, you know, to kind of manage without going stir crazy? Well, without going stir crazy, it's pretty easy because we have uh, we have windows that look back on our Earth, and it's the most amazing view you could ever imagine. And so, any chance we get, we run down there and take a, a glimpse back at our home planet, and that solves most of your problems. 
I would also say I'm one of the luckiest astronauts to have flown because our six-person crew, uh, we have a German, another American, and three Russians, and we're all super good friends. Uh, every Friday night, we gather around the dinner table. Uh, we talk about what's going on in our lives, how our families are doing, and uh, I think because of that, we have an amazing cohesion, and uh, I, would, I would go anywhere with these uh, five other guys. So what would you say are, you know, some of the things that you miss most and uh, some of the things you appreciate most about being in space? Well, the things I miss most, first of all, definitely family, my wife, kids, my parents, my brother. I, I miss all those earthly treasures that are uh, human beings. Um, I was thinking the other day, I definitely miss pizza. I, I really, right now, after two months in space, I miss this simple act of just sitting down on a couch and that relaxing feeling you get when you sit down. Uh, I look around the space station, there's not a chair up here because we just don't need it. You just lift your legs up and you're sitting. Uh, so I miss some of those little things. Uh, but there are so many ways to compensate for that up here in space. I, just living without gravity, the things you can do, floating around, uh, moving 500-pound objects with your fingertips, and like I already said, just take one glimpse of the Earth and, uh, and your heart runs kind of crazy. It's fantastic. Great. Are there any other moments of loneliness? Yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, I have a Navy background, and I spent many, many, well, two and a half years of my life at sea. And I would say there were moments of loneliness there. But up here, this is a pretty small area. And although you can be alone in your little bedroom, which is about the size of a telephone booth, overall, I'd say uh, we almost seek out socializing up here. So lonely time really uh, it doesn't happen much. What would you think would surprise most people at home about living in space? Uh, everyone would definitely be surprised at how crazy it is when you remove gravity from everyday life. It becomes hard to eat peanuts. It's tough to go to the bathroom. Uh, your head uh, fills up with fluid as there's no gravity to pull it down. So your first week or two on the space station, it, it's like just running straight into a brick wall at high speed. It, everything is, is out of sorts. You lose tools. You lose food. Uh, you go into one module. You end up on the ceiling when you think you're on the floor and you get lost. Uh, it's just simple things when you take away gravity, it changes the way the human mind works. And it took me a, a good month to adapt, but now I'm there. Can you walk me through a typical day on the space station? Sure, a typical day. We work on uh, England time, Greenwich Mean Time, and it, it looks a lot like a regular Earth day. I wake up at around 6 o'clock, brush my teeth, take a quick uh, simulated shower, which is just a wet, wet towel, but it's good enough. And then we eat, we eat breakfast, and then uh, we all gather around for a meeting with the control centers throughout the world. And uh, that's about a 20-minute evolution, and then we jump right into the workday. Uh, it's a mixture between physical activity to keep our, our body strong, and then science. And you can see around me, there's, uh, we're in the U.S. laboratory here, and we do about eight hours of science a day. Uh, you have a, sh a short lunch break. Uh, do some more work in the afternoon, and then we all tag up again at the end of the day with the control centers. And then they give us about an hour and a half to two hours before bedtime where we can just hang out, be ourselves, talk to our buddies, watch TV if we want, and then it's off to sleep and start up again the next day. Great. And one final question. You mentioned that view. Can you tell me about that view of looking back on Earth and what that means to you? Well, the first time I got to see it was uh, about an hour after I launched, the sun came up and the earth came into view over on my, uh, my buddy's side first and I couldn't see it. But all I could experience was his reaction and I wanted to unstrap and just climb over there and look out the window. But uh, about five minutes later, our, our uh, spacecraft rotated and I was able to look down the left side back at the planet. And the first thing you see is just all this blackness of space, just black as black could be. And then there's this tiny, tiny band of this crazy light blue, and it runs into our Earth. And it's the deepest blue. It's so crisp and clear when you look back on it. No picture could ever do it justice. And you, you can't help but just go, oh, it's just amazing to look down on the Earth. Commander Weissman, we really appreciate your time today. Thank you so much for um, you know, giving us all of this great information for our story. This great information for our story. Absolutely. My pleasure to talk to Nightline, and uh, thanks a lot. It was a great time. Station, this is Houston ACR. That concludes the event. Thank you.